my name is Jordi Nijenhuis, but I will never expect you to pronounce my last name because it's crazy, as you might have noticed. Um, I work for the RNTC uh, Media Training Center. We are a training center based in the media capital of the Netherlands, Hilversum. Um, we mainly work with media professionals and journalists, but we also do a lot of work with NGOs and mainly um, in bringing behavioral change through campaigns. And for the past years, social media campaigns specifically. And that's also the reason why we are involved in the Game Changer project, because we think that media can be a powerful tool to bring meaningful change to communities. So over the past two years almost, we have been involved in the Game Changer project and we have developed a curriculum to build social media campaigns with young people. So we're not telling young people to do what we think is right. No, we're working together with young people to bring meaningful change um, on issues they think are relevant. So this is our mindset. We like behavioral change. We think that media is a powerful tool to achieve the change, but also that young people are probably the most credible deliverers of this change. So this is a bit of the background um, for the Game Changer curriculum. Today, we will be going through the entire curriculum. I will show you our thinking behind it. Um, we will have a chat about the way to deliver this training, but also how to work with young people um, and give them the right tools to build social media campaigns. I won't be doing this alone because my colleague, Hannah Richter, is also in this room. Um, Maybe a couple words from you, Hannah. Who are you and what have you been doing um, yeah. in your role within Game Changer? Um, so uh, my name is Hannah. Um, I've been working alongside Jordi um, at RNTC Media Training Centre on the project. So um, as um, Aaron mentioned before, I did the state-of-the-art analysis on uh, campaigns, mainly across Europe, um, to, to give you a bit of an idea of um, different campaigns on counter-radicalization um, so that you can get some inspiration. Um, I'll be talking a bit more about that later. Um, so yeah, I'll hand back to Jordi for now. Thanks. Um, I would like to start with the agenda for today. So first we will have a little chat about um, the Game Changer project and why we're all here. Um, then we will show the tools that have been developed within the scope of this project. Um, we can have a little chat um, about how you can use the tools and what they're made for. Um, then we will take a deeper look into the curriculum and um, hopefully I can highlight some of the elements that are most important when you deliver this training yourself. Um, and then we'll have a quick chat about the way forward. Um, please treat this as an informal get together. Unfortunately, we can't be physically together, um, but this is just an informal way to make sure that you have the tools and understand the tools that have been developed um, and that you know um, and feel confident when you um, have to implement it yourself. Um, and to have a bit of a more informal atmosphere, I would like to suggest that you turn your um, zoom view into gallery view so we can see each other's faces and not just this annoying talking head from the Netherlands. Um, you can do that by clicking in the right top corner and you can select view and then you have gallery view and you can see more faces on your screen. Um, also feel free to interrupt me at any point at any time. I won't be offended. Um, if, there, if anything is not clear or if you want to ask a question, just shout, feel free. Um, no need to be shy. We all want to do something to radicalization, extremism, the rise of polarization, um, the, the impact of COVID-19 on our communities. And we hope that with this curriculum, we can bring some change. And with the campaigns that follow from this curriculum, we'll bring some meaningful change. Let me quickly go back to that slide deck again. There we go. So 
So we're here together because we want to do something to counter extremism, polarization, radicalization. Um, this has been the focal point of the, the Game Changer project. Um, but I think that the, the, the times have shown that and uh, underscores the importance of countering extremism over the past year has become bigger and bigger. So we're here and I believe there are 16 different organizations, but I'm looking at my friends from TechSoup to confirm that, but I believe 16, 18, nice. So eight organizations are here together to work as a cool band of people to counter polarization, radicalization, extremism in the world. So instead of purely focusing on Europe, as you saw on the map, we also have people um, joining us from outside Europe. And I think that's very nice to see. So happy that you're here, guys. In the end, um, hopefully some powerful and impactful youth-led social media campaigns will be created based on our project, on this meeting. Uh, and these social media campaigns can pretty much do anything these young people want, as long as they are aimed to inspire change, to make their communities a better place, to lower the temperature of specific discussions, to decrease polarization, to counter extremist views. Pretty much everything is possible, as long as it comes from the minds and the inspiration of these young people. During this project, there had, um, we, we've run some campaigns already, um, some pilot campaigns. Um, they have been successful to a certain degree, um, but it was a nice pilot to see whether the curriculum works, whether these young people um, could build the campaigns themselves, run the campaigns themselves. So there are some lessons learned. Um, so feel free to ask us at any point of time if you want to have some um, um, information about those campaigns. Um, but in the end, the ultimate goal is that these campaigns will be created by young people themselves. So we're here as coaches, as trainers, as coaches, as facilitators. We're not here to tell these young people what to do. We will just purely offer them the tools, the insights, the knowledge to achieve meaningful change. Um, and I think that's important to remember. So sometimes um, we've, we've noticed that sometimes people want to take control, but in the end, the most powerful campaigns originate from young people themselves. They have credibility. They are authentic to their communities. Um, and they, they know what works. They know how to use social media. So don't underestimate young people. They, they are the credible sources in the, in the campaigns. The process is as follows. So today we're meeting here for a session for about two hours. Um, I will give a quick introduction into the curriculum. Um, we will have a chat about working groups and how we can support each other. Um, then afterwards, um, you will go out and um, meet with young people, try to set up campaign teams, um, train them, give them the tools and techniques to build campaigns with meaningful change. Then sometime mid-February, we will meet again on Zoom. We will have a one hour coaching session, maybe a bit more, depends. Um, you can ask questions. We can have a quick check in on how, it, uh, how it's going with you all. Then afterwards, ideally, we would see some um, campaigns being implemented. Then in mid-March, we will have an online coaching session again. And then after that session, we will wrap up. We will send out some surveys to see how you've done. Um, and then we will meet again sometime in April where we can have a wrap up meeting, uh, meeting where we can um, highlight successes, maybe some failures, which is also okay, of course, some lessons learned um, and some evaluation. Um, so I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to help you to do it. Um, I, look at me as a coach. I will be involved throughout this entire process. Um, our dear friends from TechSoup will be involved throughout the process, 
Hannah will be involved and we're just here to help you. We're here to help you to have meaningful campaigns, to build meaningful campaigns with young people. Um, we will have a chat about um, maybe setting up a WhatsApp group or Facebook group to stay in contact where you can just easily ask questions throughout the project. So there's no need to stick with these meetings to ask questions. Uh, we're, we're here to help. And that brings me to the tools that have been developed within the scope of this project. So, um, when was camp actually? Can someone remind me? May? October? October? Yeah, yes, October. camp was in October. October. Time is strange this year. But okay, <laughs> October. In October, <laughs> we had a huge um, online event um, where we had different experts joining us, um, people working with TikTok as a social media platform, people working with Instagram. Um, we had some um, experts on radicalization, polarization, a lot of sessions were hosted. And luckily those sessions were recorded. So if you go to the website, you will find these recordings um, and that can help you bring some depth to your knowledge. So some more body, some more context. Um, if someone wants to work with TikTok, I think uh, a video from a camp session on TikTok could be a nice starting place for you to update your knowledge. Um, there are some recordings about radicalization, about what has been happening in Europe. So there's a lot of information there. So that's a nice tool um, you can use um, when you're setting up or when you're working with young people. There are also some tools um, in relation to understanding radicalization and what, ha what has been happening in the past. Um, inspiring collection of campaigns, for example, but also knowledge about what's effective when it comes to countering radicalization. And I'm going to ask Hannah to tell you a bit about that later. Um, and of course, we have the social media campaign tools. They are all on the Game Changer website. And I will show you where they are. There we go. So um, when you go to the Game Changer website, there's this tools library on the top. And when you click on it, you will see the recordings, all um, knowledge about addressing and understanding radicalization and also the tools um, for social media campaigns. So it's a big library. It's about TikTok, it's about Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Understanding radicalization is also a very important place to go. And I'm going to ask Hannah to share your knowledge. Give us your highlights. What is this and how can we use this? Sure. Um, do you want to click on on maybe the summary just so they can? Might be nice. Um, the state of the art analysis um, is pretty much it, it's split into three chapters. Your first chapter has um, over a hundred different campaigns listed and explained with links to them, um, so that. You can have a look yourselves. You can get some inspiration from them. You can see what they did that was good, what maybe wasn't so good, um, anything, any highlights um, and things like that. They are absolutely to be used for just as inspiration, not to be copied because um, everybody's needs are different for uh, their target audience, for their goals, their aims, um, the impact that they're trying to make. So absolutely use these as inspiration, but don't specifically copy them. Um, chapter two uh, takes a look at the current thinking of um, everything that is out there at the moment. It looks at some key resources, some other toolkits that might be able to help you, um, some academic research as well. And that uh, will just give you a bit of, bit more of um, knowledge on on counter radicalization and, and things that are going on at the moment in the world. Uh, and then the final chapter um, are the key takeaways from three different roundtables that um, we put on, uh, which was uh, 
back in the end of 2019. Um, we had three roundtables in Brussels, in London and in The Hague um, with experts and practitioners, people that are working in counter-radicalization on these kinds of campaigns um, every single day. So this was some, show, just showed some key takeaways that we had from the roundtables um, to, to try and identify what the best practices are for, for campaigns um, and how to build your campaign specifically. Um, and then we finish with the conclusions and recommendations of the best way really to build a campaign, looking at your target audience, looking at your goals, your aims, um, analyzing your risks, and also finally how to um, evaluate and, and continue with monitoring evaluation throughout your, um, your process. So yeah, that's a, a bit about the um, state of the art analysis. There is a summary document, uh, which is much, much shorter. And if you don't have so much time, then maybe you want to have a look at that. Um, but if you do have a lot of time and want to go really in depth and, and take a look at, look at it, then, then have a look at the, the big document, um, which uh, yeah goes through everything in, in a bit more detail. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you'll find it useful and it will help you to, to look at some campaigns for, for different ideas. We've highlighted some that, um, that are like that we believe to be the, the best campaigns because they had the, uh, uh, they had really good results um, and, and did, did quite well of that. I've also, they've also been categorized. So yeah, you can see <laughs> Jordi uh, zooming into them there. Um, they've also been categorized. Uh, so you've got your educational campaigns, you've got your uh, counter narrative campaigns, disinformation campaigns. Um, there's about 12 different categories, I believe um, that they can be put into and also uh, go some of the campaigns go across both so i don't believe the campaign crossover table is in the summary document geordie but um you, you could see that in the main in the main document um so yeah that's just a bit of a brief overview uh if you've got any questions about them um then please please do ask um yeah back to you geordie cool thank you so much um so so it's a nice collection of inspiration i would say um, but also this research um, has fed into the curriculum. So all the, the findings and all the key takeaways, we used it to build a curriculum that should be appropriate for young people. Um, and with that, let's um, show you some of the social media campaign tools. Um, there is a communication manual and an evaluation manual. Um, maybe Aaron can briefly explain Explain those documents, if you like. Yes, know. my internet is uh, not the most stable thing <laughs> in the world at the moment. But um, anyways, as, as it relates to our evaluation manual, manual and our communication manual, those were actually developed by um, one of our project partners as well. Um, their name, their, the Kobo Association, they're based out of uh, Warsaw, Poland, actually. And the purpose of those documents is more or less uh, to guide you through um, the process of in, of creating these campaigns, so how to communicate effectively, how to evaluate campaigns accordingly. So these are a little bit outside of what Yordi is doing, but within these documents, there's a tremendous amount of um, essentially tables, different worksheets, um, and different things that you can use uh, with your young people. So just to backtrack real quick, whenever we're referring to these young people, uh, you'll hear us say ambassadors of change. Those are the young people that are leading campaigns. Um, but these documents are meant to um, be utilized in addition to uh, the, the materials that Yordi is, is mentioning. Um, and again, we're not suggesting that you need to read all 160 pages of these documents that we have in addition, but feel free to look through them um, and see what you might, what might benefit uh, the ambassadors of change that you're working on, because it does help them to kind of refine and determine uh, maybe who your target audience is, um, what each person's role within the campaign is, et cetera, et cetera. So those are there as well. And then there is also um, what we have is called as uh, an extended index, which will kind of go through some of the key highlights from each section. So that way you can, you can go in that and you can see uh, maybe if you want to focus on a specific section uh, within each document. Right. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, so more tools. Yay. 
Um, but then there's also the curriculum. And the curriculum is actually a two-day training. Um, we envisioned that this was supposed to be a two-day offline training. But I think it's quite easy to implement it online as well. And if you're really um, limited on time, probably you can squeeze it into one day or you can spread it out over multiple days. That's pretty much up to you. Um, but the way it's structured is it's a two-day training, um, two full days. Um, I will also try to highlight the things, the bits and pieces that I think are most relevant and most important. So if you're limited on time, um, you can focus on those components. Um, the official training curriculum consists of a training, uh, of a trainer's manual. So this is something as a background document. I trust that you're all great trainers. So um, if you're feeling confident, you can probably just give it a quick read and then you're done with it. Um, the curriculum also consists of a slide deck for day one and day two. I will go through those just in a couple of minutes. Um, and these slide decks accompany a big canvas and a handbook for the ambassadors of change or the young people you're going to work with. Basically, this handbook um, should be enough. So you can just hand it to your young people and then you're done. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, it, it should, it, it needs a bit of explanation, um, but um, the, the slide decks and the canvas are all structured in relation to this handbook. And the handbook is quite straightforward. So this is something for the young people. You can print it out. Maybe you can transfer it to an online space. It depends on how you're going to implement it. Um, but it's a step-by-step -step handbook to set up and to build powerful campaigns. Um, on page one, it starts with a campaign skills quiz. It's short, it's sweet, it's uh, fairly easy, but it helps us to start thinking about what kind of roles we need in a campaign team. So when you're working with um, more people in one campaign team, definitely um, have them run through this quiz. And then if they score um, mostly A, B, C, D, or E, they get a role within a campaign team. And you see these logos on the left. So magnifying glass, glasses, cup of coffee, et cetera. They, these are also mentioned throughout the handbook. And also they correspond with the slide decks I'm going to show later. So if someone in a campaign team um, is a radicalization spotter, then he or she should pay extra attention when um, we address chapter six, seven, eight, et cetera, et cetera. And that's also labeled on the slide deck. So that's a fun way to, to make it a bit more engaging, interactive within campaign teams. Also to have clearer roles for the people who are in a campaign team. And as I said, all these chapters correspond with the slide deck and most of them correspond with a square on the canvas. The handbook consists of highlights, so short bits and pieces of explanation, um, an explanation on what radicalization is, for example, um, why we need campaigns, but also some activities for them to fill in. So make sure you take a close look at this handbook because they all, all these exercises and activities um, are there to build up a campaign. And for the young people, so for the people you're going to work with, this is probably the most important document next to the canvas. And the canvas is a big sheet when you print it out, if you want to print it out, um, where they can work together, collaborate and build campaigns. So it's just like the mural. You can whack post-it notes on there. You can write some notes on there. Um, and they are all accompanied with an exercise or activity in the handbook. Can I interrupt okay. you now? Okay. I just want to tell you all, remind you your this question and request. If you have any question, just jump and ask. So Deborah, please. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but it's because 
Uh, <laughs> now it's uh, because I work mainly with um, hate speech connected to radicalization. So this is my field. And I was uh, intrigued when I saw the handbook when you also sent it by email. But the fact that you chose PewDiePie as an example of influencer, when PewDiePie pretty recently is, it was it kind of at the center of, um, um, you know, indeed, uh, kind of fool some kind of hateful uh, expressions like anti-semitics or things like that so I said why choosing PewDiePie uh, so even though I, I know it's kind of a, a very good example of a very influential influencer but uh, since you know it grew, grew to fame very quickly it's the, that kind of example of a person who like sometimes lack of general awareness of some things and you know he made a couple of huge mistakes in communication which still it's difficult to assess if they were with malice or without malice it's still difficult to assess so i just wanted to point out that you know sometimes um in, when it's you know talking about communication and choosing personas and influencers it's also important to kind of you know point out these things because especially for younger audiences who are following maybe more this kind of uh, uh, fields that are online. There was some fuss around PewDiePie. I think it was, if not last year, two years ago, like pre-corona anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. I, I know that PewDiePie, is a, it's, a, it's a bit of a controversial figure, mm -hmm. um, but still he's got a, he's got a big following. Um, and it doesn't seem to decrease that much, even though he's, he's, he's kind of hateful. He's, he has this ties to the alt-right. Um, no, it's, it's definitely not a nice guy. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Um, I would never um, ask him to join me on my campaign team. Um, but still, he is an influencer. Whether he's a good influencer or a bad influencer, I think that's a different discussion. But it, he's still highly influential, especially within the gamer scene. Um, so yeah, um, I think this, this, this entire curriculum is also, it should be pretty easy to tailor it. Maybe we'll use local examples or influencers for, for your country or your community specifically. Um, so f I would even suggest to do that, make it as local or um, yeah, as local as possible. Um, we just put PewDiePie in here because he's, he's like the archetype of the influencer, right? He was the first guy who really became big um, through the internet. And also I think it's a nice um, discussion point with uh, young people. So he is influential. Um, he's also a bit of a dodgy figure. He's not that nice, but still- nice he because does we already struggle to be nice and popular, like, it's like we always start when we are activists for human rights or whatever. We already start kind of as more losers. <laughs> so even if you use this kind of example as positive one, it's just, um, you know, sometimes I struggle with that because it seems like you are starting. I don't like using the expression losers and winners because it's polarizing. But it's, um, you know, it's kind of saying that, you know, as a good example, we need to use somebody that, it became popular also being edgy and saying kind of not nice things. I know it's more kind of philosophical kind of thing, but not very practical. So maybe it's not the right place, but it was just wanted to mention that it's kind of, you know, as an approach to the model that we are choosing. But, you know, I see your point. It's still um, the archetypical figure of the influence and one of the first ones. So I can see yeah. that. Thank you for your yeah. answer, Andy. Oh no! Thank you for your comment. Um, and and again, this I think this 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 curriculum can be easily tailored. Um, also, we didn't want to go for how to say it. Uh, we we don't want to shy away from controversial topics. So I think this curriculum is also in that spirit that we 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 should have an open and honest discussion with young people about controversial topics like a PewDiePie. What's the uh, border between freedom of speech and hate speech, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's, that's also the reason why we kept him in because this, he was already in the curriculum way before um, he kind of joined the alt-right unofficially. Um, 
So yeah, we, we decided to keep them in because actually the entire curriculum is based on that philosophy that it should be okay to have controversial discussions or conversations with young people. Yeah, but thanks for pointing it out. Are there any other questions, comments, remarks? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, have you already like uh, tried it out to give this training online for youngsters? Because I see most of them are like topics about age 12 to 15. So I'm just wondering how is your experience of doing it online? So it's like two days in a row, at least for us, like it's a no-go, but <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, yeah. so I, I, I think we need a, a, a flexible mindset here. We haven't tried it online yet, unfortunately. So all the trainings, um, and the pilot campaigns were implemented just before um, the corona pandemic started. Um, the good thing is, is that it's, it's a big part of it is self-explanatory. So this handbook hopefully is clear enough for um, older age groups, I'd say. If you want to do this with younger age groups, then it, it, it will probably be a bit more hands-on. Um, but the thing is that, that you know, the, the activities and the exercises, they can be done online. So a tool like Mural is, is a nice tool to work with because you can have the same dynamic with the canvas, for example. You can just ask them to put on post-it notes and work together and craft this campaign over there. So that should be possible. Um, but yeah, I, I would not advise to do two full days of training online, no. Not with young people. <laughs> okay. Any other questions at this point? Yeah. So I would like just to ask you, can you please describe, because I believe that the organizations here, uh, coming here, are not yet deciding if they should have a training for all ambassadors at one time, or if they should support them individually. So can you just please, uh, you know, give us a hint, like what is our, what is organization's way to deal with uh, the ambassadors of change, besides recruiting them, of course. So if we have ambassadors of change, what should we do then? So do you mean whether to have individuals run a campaign or run through this curriculum or groups? You mean? Yeah, because yeah. I believe I, both I, are possible. I, Just yeah. Both are possible, but I would strongly suggest to use groups or teams. I think um, there's more creativity when you work in a group. Uh, people challenge each other thinking. Um, um, you really have to um, explain what you mean and um, why you want to go a specific route when you work in a, in a group. Um, so that makes the message sharper, more focused, more spot on. Um, so definitely that. It is possible to do it as an individual, but I think a lot of the joy will disappear because then you're just filling out a canvas. You're just running through exercises as an individual. It's way more fun to do it in a group. And yeah, so... Just to, just to further up what Jordi was saying, um, based on our experience in conducting these campaigns with our project partners who had done them previously, uh, there very much is a sweet spot. So the individuals, we only had two individuals that conducted uh, their, their own individualized campaigns, but both of those people had thousands of followers already. So they were already influencers in their own right. They were already very familiar with creating content. So one of the things that we found is that a lot of people uh, we consume social media, but we don't post our own social media. So there's a complete difference between, of course, consumers and, and people that are that are influencers in their own right. But then we also had campaigns in which people ran where we had a whole class of 17, 18, 19, 20 people. And that is too pro that's too chaotic to get to break those people into doing all of those activities. So there is a sweet spot where you can um, kind of break the work apart a couple different people. Uh, and, and you can have multiple people creating content, uh, working on that, and then sending it to the person, whether or not they're posting on their individual accounts or whatever, which you already may get into later. 
Um, but I think also to address Hanya's question, and I, I think she was also asking how these trainings should be conducted. So should what should be a, con a training be conduct conducted with a single campaign or campaign group? Or can you, for instance, train uh, three different groups? So let's say you have, for example, six people, and you can train all six people who will then be conducting three campaigns. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, it depends on the setup. Um, but if you, you can go through the entire curriculum and then just break them up into their little campaign teams when they have to do an activity or exercise. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's definitely possible. Um, we, we, we piloted this training with four different campaign teams. Those campaigns were never implemented, but just to go through the process. Um, and it was just in one room. Yeah, and just to further, again, based on our experience previous as well, we, we conducted a training with uh, 24 uh, young people in Poland, uh, and we had a, a wide group of people. We had a group of people that were 13 to 14 years old, uh, and there was about four or five of them. Then we had another group that was between 16 and 18. We had another group that was between 14 and 17. Um, so it's totally possible to conduct those trainings together. It's just a matter of a feasibility, practicality, um, what language you're conducting it in. So all of those factors, but you're more than welcome to train people uh, in one group. So you don't have to conduct five separate trainings if you are to do five different campaigns, just to, just to clarify. Clear. Okay. Um, where were we? So the canvas is pretty much the outline for the campaign. It's, it's, it has all the components and the elements that are, that you have to discuss before you actually start implementing a campaign. Um, and this is also the end result of the training, a nice filled in canvas. So the canvas, super important, the handbook for the Participants, very important. Um, and this is also a nice document they can reflect on after the training. So all the, the key elements also from the slide deck are in uh, the handbook. So make sure you really take a close look at the handbook before you implement the training. Um, because it has pretty much everything or all the things you need to discuss with the young people, the people who are going to implement the campaigns. Let's take a quick look at the slide decks because that's probably the thing you're going to focus on the most while implementing these trainings and working with young people. Um, I think it should be short and sweet because I want to allow some time to um, for you to ask questions afterwards. So I'm just going to run through them um, and highlight the most important parts uh, and maybe give a quick explanation of our thinking behind it. But that should be enough. In the slide decks, you'll find speaker notes. So there's a brief explanation on all the activities and what to do uh, when you arrive at a certain slide. So it should be fine. Um, and therefore I won't um, go into presenter mode. So as you can see, um, there are some notes on every slide. Uh, make sure to reflect on those. If you're implementing a, <coughs> sorry, uh, a two day training, this is generally the outline for day one. So you start with uh, a chat about radicalization. Um, then we move to audiences and why audiences or focusing on audiences are important. How to translate those audiences into personas. Um, we will have a chat about radical narratives, where to find an audience and how to persuade an audience, very important. So, of course, you can start with introductions, up to you. Um, when you're working in a com with campaign teams, make sure to do the quiz, as I told you, because it's so much fun to have different roles. And then they, these kids really can focus on their roles within a campaign team. And these icons are 
um, can be found on all the intro slides. So the, the slides before a new um, topic or a new chapter starts. And if you take a look on the roadmap, you'll see these icons on the right. Um, these icons mean that um, some work has to be done on the big canvas. So for how to zero in on, an, on your audience, there's an activity that um, will, has to be done on the canvas. And it will be the case whenever an icon like this appears on your screen. There is a little icebreaker activity, super short and sweet, but again, feel free to replace it with whatever works for you. Um, and then the real stuff starts, and that's all about radicalization. We tried to keep it rather broad because there are so many ways to talk about radicalization. Um, we like to talk about us versus them worldviews, um, polarization, thinking in opposites and absolutes, um, but also intolerance, hate speech, and even or violence, of course, violence, but also intolerance, hate speech, and negative thoughts about an other group. Um, we use that as an explanation or description of radicalization as well. Um, feel free to tailor this, but um, it's, it's probably wise to keep it rather broad and vague. Um, we don't expect these young people to do something against hardcore radicals, right? We want them to do something positive for their communities, bring people together. Is there a question or did someone unmute his or her microphone by accident? I will just continue then. Um, yeah, it was an unmuted microphone. Clear. So we kept it rather broad and vague. Um, there is some more detail later on when we talk about radical narratives. It might become a bit clearer there. Um, but from our experience, young people definitely know what's happening in their communities. They know what can be dangerous. They know what groups are active. They know what's happening in their schools, et cetera, et cetera. So just have an open um, discussion with them. Then there is this slide. It might be a bit um, controversial, but here we talk about radicalization and that people move and maybe become more extreme based on their opinions. So it starts with opinions, beliefs, feelings, and then people might become activists, and then maybe they start to use violence so that we can define that as extremism. And then there's this threshold when something becomes terrorism. I like to use PETA as an example because PETA can be perceived as an extremist organization, but they're also um, ac hardcore activists. And it's, it's nice to show the other side of the coin because when you talk about radicalization, people or young people, easily think about um, um, jihadism, sometimes far-right extremism, but there's, there's this blind spot. And I think PETA can be perceived as extremists by some people. So it's a nice example, but um, I should tailor this, um, or I would tailor this to my own context and use a local example. Uh, PETA is an American organization, of course, so I, I would change that if I were you. Um, then it's nice to have a quick chat about push and pull factors. So um, it's a discussion about why people become more extreme in their thinking. Is it because of they have an, um, an, a need or an urge from themselves, or they might be pushed because they're being um, discriminated, they are uh, in poverty, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a nice way to address those issues. It's not that people become radical because they want to do something alone. Quite often there's also a push factor, um, discrimination, marginalization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is just to set the scene for young people, to get them to start thinking about what radicalization actually is, um, why people might become radical in their own communities, um, and what's what's the basis or what's the reason why people might become radical. 
Um, and it's also nice to explain them that it's actually a game. So not every person with a strong opinion might become a terrorist. No, they, they move up and down this board of snakes and ladders. Um, there are push and pull factors in play to push them up or pull them up. Um, but we can also play this game with our campaign. So maybe pull them down this board. It's a nice analogy to use. Um, again, this is an example you can use to, to talk about um, their own opinions and whether they are little extremists themselves. There is an exercise in the handbook linked to this. Also, what's the difference between a revolutionary and a terrorist? Because quite often the terrorists think they are re revolutionaries and vice versa. Um, a quick chat about what has been happening, what kind of polarization we face, and definitely I would add COVID-19 maybe to this discussion. We have identity. about visual identity. Marina, are you, don't you want to ask it? So the question, if Marina doesn't want to show her. Yeah, so I, the, I'll address the question. So the question is, um, do they need to put uh, your logo in their contents and uh, where we as an organization should use your logos? So anytime you're using our trainings, um, anything that was created by us and RNTC, RNTC created this, but as a part of the Game Changer project. So any of these materials should not be changed. Um, they should be kept the same. But as far as uh, if you're asking about posting, when you post uh, about or when the ambassadors of change end up creating their campaigns, they don't need to mention, if anything, correct me if I'm wrong, Jordi, but we shouldn't mention uh, that this is a part of a project funded Please by the don't. European no. Union because then <laughs> it, it takes away from the organic uh, nature and feel of their campaign. So I'm not sure which specifically your question was directed, but I believe that would answer both. Uh, so these, these slide decks are game changer material. So please keep the game changer branding there. And definitely the EU logos you will find at the end because otherwise we'll get in big trouble with the EU. Um, but you can change the images or maybe the language. That's up to you. Feel free to do that. Um, whatever is most appropriate for the people you're working with. Um, and just to echo what Aaron said, don't brand or don't use Game Changer or EU branding on social media campaigns because then all um, all credibility will just disappear. And we're not messengers of the EU. This is the, the curriculum is funded by the EU, but what, what, the, what, what the campaigners are going to do with it, it's all there. It's all their stuff. It's all in their hands. Jordi, Jordi sorry if I'm interrupting you. But oh, can, they, can they use the hashtag uh, ambassador of change? If they if want. They, if they want, yeah, sure. Um, but don't, I would not push them to do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think may, maybe Jordi will get, uh, or sorry, Jordi will get into this later in the training, but uh, having a uniform camp uh, hashtag is of course relevant. But for instance, we, we made the mistake, meaning me, I made the mistake for asking uh, some of our project partners to try to find a uniform hashtag. We ended up deciding on ambassadors of change, uh, but of course, uh, number one spelling, uh, is an issue number two. A lot of the people that we were working with weren't native English speakers. So we ended up with a tremendous amount of typos where we had ambassador of change. We had ambassadors of change misspelled. So just be mindful that of course, uh, the simplicity of a hashtag is, is relevant. And, and uh, yeah, I, we would encourage um, a, a hashtag to be used throughout your campaign for you to follow is, is also very relevant. Okay, thank you. Great. Yeah, and I've, I've, so everything in this curriculum is just um, getting the right questions to these young people. So all the decisions that um, have to be made before our campaign starts should be made by these young people. So I think your, your role or your job in this sense is just to be a coach, work with them. Um, but in the end, they, they should be owners of their campaigns. 
So if they want to use the hashtag ambassadors of change, by all means, sure. If they think that's the most appropriate way to set up a campaign, definitely. If they want to do something entirely different, as long as there's no risks there, by all means, that's also okay. So, so um, really think, think about your role as a coach. Coach these kids, Go, coach these young people, make sure that they understand um, what's needed to build campaigns go through the process but in the end they should be their the, the owners of their own campaigns and make make these decisions and there's a lot of power in that um and also you know it's 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 way more fun so we're not asking these young people to do something we're working with them to do something and that's that's way more fun for them also for us um and also makes more powerful campaigns with more impact and I, I, I personally really believe in that um, philosophy. So we're just here to, to scale them, to, to give them the right tools, give them the right questions, and then they should be able to run it themselves. To continue with the curriculum, so this, this first part, what is radicalization? It's about setting the scene, getting them in the right mindset. Um, there's also this ethical question. So a lot of protests, can be perceived as ethical. Um, sometimes they're labeled as being extremist. Um, sometimes we talk about identity and identity issues. What is ethical? When is it not ethical? Um, for younger age groups, it's maybe better to leave this out because it can be complicated and confusing. If you're working with older um, audiences, then definitely leave it in. Um, and then at this point, we introduce the canvas. So um, if you're implementing offline trainings, make sure that it's a nice, cool looking, big um, piece of paper. Um, if you don't want to print it, you can easily just draw some boxes, label them one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure that it looks fun and engaging. And then the hard work starts because then it's time to focus on audiences. And we've put audiences in the beginning because it's very important to think about the target audience of a campaign. Um, sometimes young people will come into the room and they have their ideas already and they want to just share this message. But if it's not directed towards a specific audience, it will miss the mark. It will not make an impact. It won't reach the people you want to reach. So that's why we start with target audiences and definitely spend some time on this part. I think this is very important. So maybe to quickly highlight the parts of the canvas that I think are most important. Square number one, target audience statement, definitely. Um, square number two, persona three, four, and five can be done um, by themselves with the use of the handbook. You don't necessarily have to coach them through this process. Of course, if you do it, it's better, but it's not that um, difficult. Six is very important, the aim of a campaign. Nine is also very important, the smart goals and actions, and then 12 and 13. The other parts are quite easier, are easier to get when you go through the handbook yourself. But definitely square number one needs most coaching, six as well, nine, 13, 12. Just so you know. So uh, audience mapping, very important. And in the notes, there is a step-by-step -step guide. There is also, uh, there are also a lot of activities in the handbook with a clear explanation. So in the handbook, it should also be super clear to do this. Um, and then I believe Aaron sent you an additional handout. It's not on the website though, um, but it's a, it's a huge map. You can print and you can do these activities and these exercises on that map as well. And again, alternatively, you just, take a piece of whiteboard, whiteboard or a piece of paper and you just draw a big circle and create a map over there. That's also easy to be done. Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of slides. 
So just go through this activity, through this exercise, step by step. Um, the example in here, I think is quite clear. It's about um, smoking. So I wouldn't recommend to change that, but you can tailor it if you like. And then in the end, um, there's this activity where they create a target audience statement and put it on the canvas. So this is the first thing you actually put on the canvas and it should be an explanation or description of a target audience um, and why they engage in a specific type of behavior. That might sound very abstract right now. So make sure you check the handbook and the speaker notes in this part, and then it should be clear. So in the handbook, we've, we've highlighted all the concepts and um, terms with specific colors to make it a bit clearer for you as well. Um, take some time, and I would suggest to practice this maybe by yourself or with some colleagues or friends before you actually go through this with the, the young people. Um, afterwards, persona, it's um, pretty straightforward. So you can craft a persona. Um, give him or her a name, and then make sure that to underline this, this persona is the most important guy or girl for the campaigners. Everything they will design afterwards, everything they think of should make sense in relation to this persona. So you can maybe even ask one of the kids to make a drawing of this persona, put it on a board or put it on uh, an online space. Um, make sure that this persona becomes a real person, make sure that it comes to life. Um, and then it's about radical narratives. What is propaganda? Um, how is ideology in the mix when we think about propaganda? And then we put in a couple examples to highlight radical narratives. Um, and this can easily be tailored towards your context in your country. So maybe it doesn't really make sense to talk about the far right or jihadi narratives, et cetera, et cetera. So you can put some local examples in here, should be fairly easy. Um, there are some videos in here that highlight why emotion is important when it comes to uh, propaganda and radical narratives. And then there's this activity where they write out the radical narrative for their target audience on the canvas. Um, then we move back to our target audiences and think about where they are, how can we reach them, where can we reach them? And this, this is um, where we start thinking about um, where can we put our messages? Do we have, want to run an online campaign? Do we want to run an online and offline campaign? What platforms are they consuming? What kind of content are they pursue, uh, consuming? Um, Make sure that the platform they pick is appropriate for the target audience. So probably they feel, or we feel more comfortable with using Facebook, for example. Maybe that does not make sense for the target audience, right? So if we want to address older people, maybe these young people want to run a campaign addressing older people, then there's no point in using TikTok because there are just a handful of old people on TikTok. Um, maybe we have to think about different ways to reach them. So make sure again that it works for their target audience. Um, then we talk about persuasion. Um, why is persuasion important? What kind of things can we teach or make sure that our audiences learn through a campaign? And how um, does that link to behavioral change? And how can we make sure that campaigns um, move people towards new behavior. So think about what behavior you want to change and who can make that change, who can bring that change to these communities, to the target audience. It's a step-by-step -step thing. So it's about credible sources, logical approaches, emotional, emotional appeals. There are some videos um, to highlight specific components here. Um, and again, this is also in the handbook. And then we can talk about specific influencers. That's a nice uh, activity. And then in the end, when we go through all these videos and the step-by-step -step guide, 
they should have a clear aim for their campaigns. What do we want to achieve? And how do we get there? What is the new reality we want to introduce? And this may look a bit boring because it looks like it's mathematics. And personally, I hate mathematics, but it's a nice way to explain what we need to set up a clear aim. Um, again, this will make sense if you look at the handbook closely. This is also labeled with colors, so it looks flashy, but it will, it will make it a bit more clear. Um, but really think about all these steps and these ingredients. So make sure that the math is correct. Make sure that it's written in a way that the mathematics are correct. And then you have a clear campaign aim. And then we put that on the canvas. And that's pretty much everything we do in day one. Um, it is possible to start with target audience mapping and then move to persuasion if you want to run through it quicker. So as I, as I said with the canvas, you can start maybe with setting the scene, then focus on target audience statement and move to aim directly. That's possible because aim, the campaign aim builds on the target audience statement. And then the rest can be done individually as homework, et cetera, et cetera. So that is possible, but make sure that the target audience statement is clear and the aim is entirely clear. Um, after day one, we sometimes ask them to um, think about campaigns that have been inspirational to them. Um, it's a nice way to start thinking about actual the, the, the design of a campaign, et cetera, et cetera. And then we move to day number two. So let me share that slide deck as well. There we go. Um, and day number two, so we don't have to do maths anymore, which is very helpful. So you can reflect on the homework um, and then we start thinking about campaigns. So campaigns is a system or collection of stories, something that's strategic, has a clear goal, um, and try to make sure that the goal of the campaign is measurable because it will help you to check whether the campaigns have been successful. Um, and also it helps them to think about the impact they want to make. So make sure that there is a measurable goal of a campaign. Here is some inspiration on how to set up campaigns in relation to extreme or radical narratives. So you can reflect on the previous part of the, of the canvas where we talk about radical narratives. Here you can um, think about what kind of narrative can we put opposed to that. Do you want to do a counter narrative? Do you want to offer an alternative? What kind of stories do we want to share in our campaign, et cetera, et cetera. And then that also has a nice place in the canvas. Then we talk about key messages. What is the, what is my selling point of the campaign? What is my, um, my main message and why is this campaign uh, needed? Very important. And here are some slides. It's mainly for inspiration. So what can we do with offline campaigns? a billion things, what can we do when we talk about online campaigns, a billion things. So make sure that it's, or, or, or try to um, come up with some creative ideas, get them to, to a nice creative um, a mindset and make sure that they're, that they're not going for, we want to produce four videos because videos are fun and interesting. No, really think about the impact. What do we want to achieve? And what is the best way to achieve that change? What is the best way to achieve that impact? And that can be translated into smart goals. It's a bit tricky and it sounds maybe a bit NGO-y and a bit uh, boring, but smart goals, if you do it correctly, forces them to think about specific impacts that is also measurable um, 
and attainable, relevant, time bound, et cetera, et cetera. So if you formulate a smart goal based on all these components, then it becomes something that's realistic. And it forces them to think about impact and change instead of, yeah, we're going to do four videos. No, why are you going to do four videos? What is the goal? And um, how can we achieve that goal? So smart goals definitely spend some time there because this is also the part where you go from abstract ideas and notions and concepts towards something that's concrete, focused, and actually doable. So this is also a creative part of the training, um, a bit challenging because you have to translate broad ideas and a lot of information into something that's, 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 that's feasible. So definitely spend some time on smart goals. Um, but it will be very helpful in the end. And there uh, should be plenty of space on the canvas to work on the smart goals. So that should be a big square. Um, you can ask them to write multiple. Um, and I would say don't, or, or one smart, smart goal is not enough for a campaign. We need more. It needs to be linked. A, a campaign can have uh, multiple goals and definitely force them to think about multiple goals. Um, if they, when they start writing more goals, you will see that creativity comes in and they have to think about different things. So that's, that's, that's nice. Um, then there is a discussion about risks. So make sure that they really think about the risks of running a campaign and also think about how to navigate those risks. So what are we going to do when people are going to attack us? Um, are we safe, even physically safe? Are people going to be offended by our campaign? Um, make sure that they're not going to run a campaign that gets them into real trouble. So this is, as a coach, this is a place where you should step in um, when things get dodgy or risky. There are some tips on dealing with hate in the handbook. It's also on the slide. Um, make sure that they think about it and make sure that they have something in place before they start implementing the campaign. Um, then there is this part about content, content creation, um, things you need in powerful content. So a call to action, um, the differences between engagement. And I think this is also very important, especially when we're running online campaigns, not all engagement is created equally. If I um, get a like on a post, that means that someone saw my content and liked it, right? But we don't know whether that content made um, actual change in the minds of people. So this is a nice conversation to have. Um, and it's pretty much, it's, we labeled it flirting engagement, dating engagement, and committing engagement. And the whole point is that the longer an audience spends time with your campaign and the more um, feedback or the more engagement and interactivity your content has and an audience has with your campaign, the more sure you are that you made a change with your online activities. So don't go for a like. Maybe we should go for um, a campaign where we ask people to contribute. Maybe we have to set up an offline event and move people from online spaces to that offline space. That tells us more about the impact we have, of course. Um, and yes, there is um, a discussion we should have um, about that as well with the young people. Then there is a square for calls to action. Um, and also about how we're going to measure the impact of the campaign. Then there's this part about branding, campaign identity, some tips about um, having recognizable campaigns. There's something on vanity versus impact metrics. So again, don't go for reach views or likes. Maybe we can have a bit more. Maybe we can look into conversion, moving people to different spaces, making sure that people spend a lot of time with our campaign. Um, there's this part about content planning and there's a template in the handbook as well. So you can 
at this point, you can really structure a campaign even. If you think that the campaign is good to go, you can already start planning content and dividing tasks with the team members to make sure that the campaign actually gets implemented and that everyone understands their role and what they have to do in the campaign. And then at the end, there is a part about success. And this is the part where you can ask them, what is your um, definition of success? So we've got this broad problem. We know that things are happening in our community. We narrowed it down to a specific target audience. We've got a clear solution. How are we going to define our success? When are we satisfied? When do we know if our campaign has been successful? And that's a, that's a, that's a nice note to end on because it's a nice, moment of reflection to really think back to um, the previous parts of the canvas, um, previous activities, and let's zoom in. And what, what does meaningful change mean to you? And when are you happy at the end of a campaign? So that's the training in a nutshell. There's a lot of stuff here. It's, um, it's linked to the handbook and the canvas, of course. Um, there are, uh, speaker notes on every slide, so that, that hopefully will give you some more clarity. Um, one important thing to note is that these big canvases, the end result should be perceived as something that's flexible. So sometimes you have to go back and take an additional look at previous squares. Um, does, um, does our target audience statement still make sense? Does our persona still make sense? Do we have to make some adjustments? So definitely use post-it notes or something that can be changed easily because um, it's nice to restructure the canvas at the end and make sure that all the squares work in the end and are aligned and um, are coherent. So it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it is also a lot of fun to do. Um, it, it needs some hands on guidance. So definitely, um, do that, make sure that they reflect on everything, make sure that things are coherent, um, make sure that everything makes sense. Um, and then it should be a lot of fun to do. And I've been speaking for 30 minutes now, so I'm just going to shut up for a moment and I'm going to give you the floor. Are there any questions? One, uh, Nordi. Uh... Uh, I just mm, realized that uh, mainly the the training days are uh, uh, related to a, a presence uh, uh, person, like uh, not virtual, not uh, on Zoom or similar platform. It's kind of a, we are uh, gathered in a in a physical place and we are doing uh, all the training uh, all together. But uh, right now, some uh, some countries cannot do this. And uh, how can we try to I don't know? find another way to uh, to have the same kind of uh, activity, but uh, online? Good question. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's mainly, maybe the, the, the biggest concern with this curriculum. Um, it, it, the way it's designed and structured um, is for offline trainings, but I think it can be done. So we, we've been, or I've been training online a lot not with young people per se, um, but there are some tools you can use to still have that engagement and interactivity with a group. Um, so if you, if you want to, or if you have to <laughs> implement this training online, um, make sure that you've got some nice tools um, that can help you. Definitely look into Mural. Um, that's a nice space to work on a canvas, for example. Um, if you're working with a bigger group, just use Zoom and then um, break them into breakout rooms so they can work together without um, a coach or a trainer being physically there. So they can work in a group, have some engagement among each other and then ask them to report back. Um, that, can, that can help. Um, Mentimeter can be a nice tool to use. Um, so this, this curriculum, is built on engagement and having 
some interaction with your participants, uh, make sure or, or really think about how you can replicate that into online spaces. Um, introduce some cool uh, tools, have them watch some of the videos at their own time and then report back. It's uh, just make sure that they're not stuck in a Zoom room as long as we've been here right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Are there any other questions? Amina. Hi, everyone. Good to see some of you again after the training. Um, I have a comment and two questions. I will, uh, I will try to be quick. First one is uh, we planned four to five hours uh, for the training. Uh, because that's how we now materials were at the beginning. Uh, this now feels a little bit too much, especially since we wanted to engage kids with uh, elementary and high school. Uh, this seems a little bit too complicated for 12 year old kids. Uh, I've done a lot of trainings where adults have problems with smart goals. Uh, so I'm, I'm not uh, sure how much we can adapt this. Do we need to be strict uh, completely to how you present it now? Or we can modify it, uh, especially since we are going to do inclusive group with kids with difficulties. So I'm not, uh, I, I just want to know how strict you are with, uh, with this um, presentation uh, of, of a training. And the questions are about uh, trans uh, translation of the materials. Since we had an email uh, about uh, materials being translated, I'm interested in a handbook. Uh, since it's for kids, for us, for CPI team, we don't need translated materials, but handbooks would be uh, good to have translated. And then we can expect it since we plan to have this at the second week of February. And uh, the second question is about the recording of the training. Um, do we need to record all of the training with kids or it can be photos, few videos? And how are you flexible with that? Because uh, some kids can be disturbed with having uh, to be recorded all the time. It's easy for um, our offline activities, but uh, for this training, we're going to have in-person training. Uh, do we need to recall them all the way through? Um, and that's it. Yeah, I, so I, I can take that question. So uh, number one, in, in regards to translations, um, everybody that we've already spoken to, that you've expressed what language you need your uh, materials translated, we will be translating the, the handbooks into uh, the language that you chose. Of course, we'll have English. Uh, the PowerPoints, we will not have an opportunity to, to translate. They're, it's just, they're far too big uh, with all of the comments and everything included. So uh, I think our hope is that uh, there's a way that you can convey uh, the message from the PowerPoint to your target audience in, in your appropriate language. But then that gives you an opportunity because the, the PowerPoints kind of reference back to the handbooks, right, Jordi? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so. Uh, for all of you, again, that expressed what language you wanted yours in, we, we will, of course, be taking care of that. Um, and we'll be starting these translations. And that will be one of the first things that we're translating, because we do understand that many of you, um, that's one of the first activities that you'll be using, some of some of which, uh, some of you that will be using them a, as a way to potentially recruit for the games that you're playing. Um, so that's that question. Uh, and then in regards to, to your trainings, the recording the trainings is not relevant to us uh, for many reasons. One of the reasons being uh, presumably you'll be conducting it in your language. So we don't envision ourselves uh, recording, uh, translating the, tra the trainings and then doing it. That's a tremendous amount of work. Um, so I think for us, just a couple screenshots would be nice. Um, it, not necessarily as proof, like we don't need proof that you're conducting these trainings for us. It's just a way to see that you're engaging with the young people and we may, we may get some pictures out of this. And when we end up piecing a video together, end up sharing what some of you all are doing. 
Uh, I think it is, it, it'll be nice for us to share all of these trainings and all the regions and all the languages that are being done. So, so some screenshots would be nice uh, because again, we, we have uh, asked for some of those uh, as well as for online games uh, and for offline games as well. We would be asking for some photos and videos. So don't worry about recording the trainings. And then one other thing that was not asked in this question. So uh, I don't think, uh, again, you already correct me if I'm wrong, but this does not need to be a two a two day sixteen hour long training. One of the things that uh, RNTC uh, noticed uh, in in our responses when we initially conducted this these trainings uh, was that they're too long. So we know that two eight hour days is not feasible. If anything, we were trying to even shorten shorten them down to two six hour days. Um, but I believe what we're what we're expecting of you is to utilize the handbook and then to utilize elements of the powerpoints. Um, to work and create campaigns from here. So if there's elements uh, of the PowerPoint that are missed, uh, or if there's elements of the handbook that maybe you have to gloss over more quickly, um, that's okay because we can't expect you to go over every single detail, especially as it relates to the young people that you're working with. Uh, but we do, we do really encourage uh, and ask that you use as much as possible and as many of the tools that we've prepared for you, uh, the main things that we're expecting you to use are the campaign canvas, uh, what we call the target audience mapping tool, which is the map uh, that is on the website. Yordi, I added it yesterday. I realized that one of my documents was mislabeled. Um, and then, of course, the, the training handbook is, is another, uh, is the last relevant piece of that. So they're all kind of working documents. And the first two uh, are, are really great for you to help, especially again, when you're working with young people and you, I think you said some have uh, some challenges, it's really good to help understand using that target audience mapping tool to which piece of the pie, if you will, are you choosing that helps understand your target audience. Thank you, Aaron. Sorry for talking uh, on a lot. That, I uh, no, uh, thank you. And I got a similar question, like actually a following up questions according to what you said about the length of the training. Because for instance, given also the time frame for conducting the campaign, which is not so much, in our idea, since we already have a group of trained activists that do things on aid speech, like they will be the first group to train, then they will become the leaders to 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 train newcomers, new New younger people to uh, a new call. So, of course, for them, the training will be a little bit shorter because some basics they already have it. And then they decide how much they want to use of the end books. And that's, my question was exactly about how much we need to use of the end book if it's flexible and we just take what we need. So, we don't need to prove that we use like everything. So, you right. are very yes. my question. So, okay. at, that's really good. At the end of the day, as far as these trainings go, um, it, it, is, it is entirely based on the honor system. We are going to ask questions in our monitoring that help us understand where you maybe had some success with the training, where there were some challenges. Um, we're hoping that you all go through the, we're really asking, but there's no way for us to prove that you are actually using these. So, this is part of the, one of the reasons that we selected everybody here. Uh, is that we did look into your organizations. We do see that there, there is no um, credibility issues or there are no credibility issues. Um, so for us, we, we just really hope that you utilize the handbooks and all of the materials that are, that are to be used. And if you have to skip a section within the handbook because maybe you're running short on time uh, with, your, with, with your audience, um, that's great. Um, but additionally, uh, it is, it, this is one of the reasons that maybe having two trainings is beneficial because if you run through one training, you can then improve on the second training. So uh, of course you can have all the trainings done with all of the ambassadors of change that you'll be working with. Uh, but if you have two trainings, you can improve and understand, you know, maybe where things went well, where things didn't go well. Yeah. And also maybe to add to that, um, you know, these, these, these trainings and all the material that has been developed, they're just tools to achieve powerful campaigns. So in the end, we're not, we're, at least I'm not looking for this training to be implemented word by word as we designed it. No, these are just tools to help young people to build something meaningful. Um, and in the end, we all want that, right? We want to achieve change. We want to, to give these, these young people something powerful, um, um, a chance to contribute to, to improving their own communities, their own, um, um, yeah, their own communities. So um, 
look at it all as, as, as a tool or something you can use um, but as long as there's there some impact in the end, then we're more than happy. Um, and that's what we're all aiming for. So you don't have to replicate the training word by word, slide by slide. No, if you think you can do it by just giving one great person a handbook, great, go for it, right? Um, so yeah, we're just here to, to help you to achieve that. Um, and that's why it's, that's why it's a two day training because we think all these things are relevant, but um, feel free to pick and choose um, the bits and parts that are most important.